today is what we call a Vision Sunday. One of uh, the things that we're going to do in 2010 is we're going to spend uh, b- about four Sundays just stopping, catching our breath, and kind of remembering some things that we all know but forget sometimes in the hustle and bustle of life. And so today we're going to, we're going to start with one of those, and, and, and the, the focus today is about getting the right questions uh, in, in your life. And, and I know Bill Wilson and I used to joke that the best time for church attendance is after the family had been home, snowed in for a couple of days. So um, this, this, is, um, this is a good day to get out and go to church. Because if you like me, I, I hate snow. I just, I like it on a postcard. But that's as close as I want to get to it. You know, when you were a kid in school, uh, the whole focus of your life was on getting the right answer. Right? Did, do you know the answers to your multiplication table? Do you, do you know the answers to, to who the presidents of the United States are? Can you name all the capitals of the states? And it was all about having the right answer. It's only later that you realize that more important than having the right answer is making sure you have the right question. Are you answering the right questions? All of us have had that rough moment when we realize that we have the right answer but it's the wrong question. I love the guy who asked Jesus this question that we're going to read in Matthew 22 and the answer that Jesus gives him because it's about having the right questions being answered in your life. Matthew 22, stand with me in honor of God's word. So we begin reading with verse 34. Now when the Pharisees had heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they came together in the same place. And one of them, an expert in the law, asked the question to test him. Teacher, what is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus said to them, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your mind. This is the greatest commandment, the most important commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All of the law and the prophets depend on these two commandments. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. This is God's word for God's people. Hear it and believe it and live. Let's pray together. It seems simple when we hear it, but we know it is hard when we try to do it. So we pray, Father, that we will leave this moment being doers of your word and not just hearers. We pray this in your name. Amen. I spent a lot of my life in school. And one of the things you find out when you're in school, as long as I, uh, that, that I was, that, well, there's no way in the world you can do every assignment that every professor gives you. You simply cannot read all the material. You cannot read all of those books. So you have to devise a scheme. You have to find a way to find out what's important to the professor. Find out what's on the final at all cost. Even pretend to be interested in the subject if you have to but find out what's on the final exam. Now, I love this guy who asked Jesus this question because he would have been a friend of mine. Jesus, I have a question. What's going to be on the final? There are lots and lots of rules. There are lots and lots of don'ts and do's. There are ten commandments. There, if, if you're going to grade us, what are you really, really going to grade us on? I don't mind making a D, if I still get in. And Jesus said, there's two. Just two. Not ten. Just two. How hard can this be? Love God with everything you have and love your neighbor as yourself. You know, that's typical of Jesus. He gives you one of these things that sounds great and you want to go home and cross-stitch it and put it on your refrigerator door. Boy, that sounds great until you try to do it. 
when you try to do it, you realize this is a little tougher than I realize. It doesn't take you long to understand that Jesus has set up a triangle. On the top of this triangle is loving God. On either side of this triangle is loving yourself and loving your neighbor. Jesus said, love God with everything that you have. Your heart, your soul, and your mind. Now, most of us think that, if the, that, that Jesus is saying heart and that it is really, really strong emotion. Ooh, I just, I just feel so intensely in my love for God. That's not what the word heart means in Scripture. The word heart is the place of decisions, and we know this. Uh, we have this kind of illusion going on that we are logical beings. Hardly. Uh, all of us will go buy a new car and we'll do all the research about Consumers Report and we'll get on the internet, we'll find out all the gas mileage and, and collision damage and which one got the big safety report and then we'll buy it because it's blue. Or you think you really look good in it. This word heart means love God with your desires. What is it that you want? What is it that you desire? If, you, if there were no rules, if there were no consequences to your decision, and in this moment we would grant you anything you wanted, would what you wanted be simply God? I want to be like Christ. I want to be nearer to Christ. That's all I want. Not for most of us. Most of us, we would give it head knowledge. Yes, I know, that's tough. But when we got down to the secrets of what you want, most of us don't want that. And the problem with that is James reminds us in his letter to the early church is what you want becomes what you do. And what you do becomes who you are. Okay? Love God with your desires. With you. Words so with your essence, with your totality, with your strength. Uh, love God in everything you do, in everything that you are. Whatever your hands find to do, Paul tells the early church, you do as if you're doing it for the glory of God. And I've told you about the church that I grew up in. And uh, our, our, uh, super, our maintenance super, uh, superintendent was a guy named Mr. Green. And he cleaned the church uh, with the idea that Jesus would be there Sunday. And we would have people slipping down all the time on the wax floors because he would wax them so thoroughly because Jesus was going to be there. So he took a very mundane job of cleaning a church facility and literally made it an act of worship. Okay? Love God with every part of your strength. Love God with your mind. Now, if you grew up Baptist like I did, it was always about loving God with your heart, but it was never about loving God with your mind. In fact, we had preachers brag on how little they knew. You know, haven't been to school, haven't been trained, just know Jesus, just know the Bible, and would literally brag on their ignorance. And, and a lot of us have grown up with that, and a lot of us see this conflict. But I want to tell you, we're in, we're in a situation now in post-Christian America where we are desperate for men and women who can put together a reasoned, articulate case for Christianity. Uh, the conversations now around the water cooler are much more difficult than they used to be because everybody's now been, been emboldened by what we call the new atheists who look a whole lot like the old atheists. I mean, once you say you don't believe in God, what else? How do you say that new? Okay, but we, we don't study, we don't read, um, we don't discipline our thinking uh, in, in the service of God. Okay? Now, a lot of us have started this thing of New Year's resolutions. We're going to have one. And some of yours was, we're going to be nicer to people. And, and you've already blown it. Here it is, the 10th of January, and, and you've got to give on to that. Somehow we think that we will have the, the, the power within ourselves to be nicer to people. 
to be kinder to people. But you and I know people are too hard to love by yourself. Uh, they lie to you. They betray you. They hurt you. They steal from you. Uh, they take things from you. They take advantage of you. And, and if you're not careful, you'll end up being very, very cynical uh, about other people. And it doesn't take long to read the newspaper about uh, what's happening in this capital city or that capital city or that state or this leader to find out that, that the fall in Genesis is very real. Now, it takes a lot to be able to authentically love somebody. And what it takes is the love of God going to you and through you. Okay, so it sloshes over. So when you come to worship, which is what the love of God is, now, we mistakenly think that this worship <laughs> is coming to church. Did you worship? Yeah, I was there Sunday. Uh-uh. This, this worship has to do more with focus, uh, lordship. Uh, who is it that is calling the shots in my life? Who is it that I'm looking to bless me? And who is it that I'm looking to serve? And who is it that I'm looking to, uh, to please? Now that, that's what the, the idea of worship is. God loves us. He started this. He comes to us. The good news of the gospel is not that you can get to God, but that God and Jesus Christ has come to you. Now that's where that relationship starts, is when he reveals himself to you. That comes then, then as he begins to fill your life with himself, you can't hold the ocean in a thimble, it begins to slosh out and to love to others. Okay? Now, I, I tell you all the time, uh, we have this, um, this issue in our culture about self-esteem. And, and, and we and we're tell parents all the time to, to help build your kid's self-esteem, and that is one, never to correct them, never to discipline, but always just tell them how wonderful they are. Oh, you're just so wonderful. You're so wonderful. And, and the problem is, one, the kid knows they're not. They know when they fail. They know when they don't do well. And when you tell them that they're doing well and they know they're not doing well, they, they, they lose confidence in their own discernment uh, because you're not being honest with them. And the other thing is, it is, it is based, their self-esteem is based on a false reality. Uh, well, a friend of mine is a college professor, and he says he spends the first six months uh, with, with new freshmen helping them reconstruct their self-esteem because some of them actually will make a C for the first time in their life, and it will devastate their self-esteem. Your self-esteem is not determined by uh, what other people think of you or by what your parents told you. I think your self-esteem is, is determined first that you were created you were created in the image of God. Okay? You bear in your life the imago dei. Second, my friends in real estate tell me that something is only worth what somebody's willing to pay for it. You are worth what Jesus Christ paid for you on the cross. That's where your self-esteem comes from. You are so eternally valued that Jesus Christ died for you. And if God is for us, it really doesn't matter who's on the other side. Okay, that's where that comes from. Now, what does that mean? That means I am free to love the other person without, them, without me needing anything else from them. They don't have to love me back. Well, I, well what if they don't love you back? I'm still full. Because God is working in my life, I still have enough love for me and them and some left over, even if they don't love me back. Okay, people come to me all the time and say, you know, hey, uh, Mike, we want to get married. We love each other, and I need her, and she needs me, and, and you know, and my life's not complete without her. No, 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 no. And I tell them two wounded people make a hospital, not a marriage. <laughs> it takes two complete people. Okay? I love Jeannie with all my heart. I don't need her. If, if something happened and I lost her, I, I, would, I wouldn't die. And one of the honest things that keeps me honest in my life is she doesn't need me. She loves me. I'm grateful. She doesn't need me. And I know, boy, 
If I got stupid, she'd be fine. That keeps this old boy real honest. You can be replaced and quickly. Yeah, you say, that's, that's, you know, we, so I'm free to love the other person without having to manipulate them, without having to do anything to them so that they love me back. Just to freely love them in the love that God has flowing in and through me. Now that happens when you go back to prayer. That happens when you come to worship. And God fills your life to the point that you slosh out on the other people. Uh, there are people in your office who need love. You know who they are. And your first response is a crinkling of your face going, that's the last person that I would ever extend love to. And that's why God does it through you, sloshes over into their lives. You can't hold the ocean in a, thumb, a thimble. You can't hold all of God's love in your heart. It gets around to everybody. That knowing more of God and knowing about yourself, that's discipleship. Okay, now, most of us, a lot of us think discipleship is just being smarter about God like we're studying for Jeopardy. And we think that, boy, just because we know all the minutia of the Bible and we, we always think that people are great disciples if, if, if they can quote a lot of Scripture and if they know all the kings of Israel and that kind of stuff, the, the point of discipleship, the point of study is not to get smarter but to become more like Christ. Okay, to know more about him so I can pattern my life after him more fully and more completely. That happens in discipleship. Now, if you hang around Jesus long enough, let me tell you what's going to happen. He's going to introduce you to some very wounded and broken people because that's what Jesus is about, seeking the lost, seeking the sick, going after the wounded. One thing about being lost is you don't know where you are, you don't know how you got there, and you don't know how to get back. Lost people have to be found. And that means somebody has to go look for them. That means that God is going to give you some really interesting friends. And the first encounter with authentic love, with love that's not trying to manipulate them or do something to them, the sick kind of love that we see in our world is going to be with you. Their first picture of Jesus is going to be of you. How, how are you kind to me? How, why do you care about me? And then you're going to be able to tell them about the relationship that you have with Jesus and bring them into that relationship because God has been loving them in Christ all along. This is service. Service is important because obedience is the only way you learn some lessons. You remember when you were in school, you would go to science, and they would give you a lecture on the frog? And then you'd go to lab, and you got to meet a frog up close and personal. That was lab. That's where you tested. That's where you tried out what you were learning in lab. So you go to discipleship and you say, boy, I am learning some great things about how to love each other and why it's important to love each other and how I need to serve uh, my neighbors and my fellow people. And then God's going to introduce you to somebody who needs service. Well, when you get into that moment of obedience, you're going to find out some things like, you know, turning away uh, 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 an angry word with, with, an ang with a word of grace really does work. Turning the other cheek really does work and it works in real life see the, the world says fight fire with fire that doesn't work that's just a bigger fire and I tell you I tell you all the time I'm the chaplain with the Brentwood police and the fire department I go out there when they fight the fires and I've yet to see them jump off the truck and set the house next to the burning house on fire <laughs> and they don't do that okay uh, they, they pour lots and lots of water on it that's the way you fight fire so when this neighbor is angry, when this neighbor is, is striking out because of their womb, you're going to be able to respond to them out of the love of God. Okay, and you're going to learn some things that you learn only in obedience. You go to class on changing a tire. Okay, I can change a tire. You can't change a tire till one goes flat on I-65. Then you pull over and you find, you find that little tool they call a tire tool. 
and you try to change tires, then you learn some things. And one, you go buy some better tools to change a tire than they give you in that car. That you, that you only learn in obedience. But let me tell you what happens in obedience. When you show up, when you show up and, and we have this situation at Station Hill, and, and we know that children are going to be a vital part of that ministry, and we know we have to have some kind of facility that supports the work of children, and we can't find an answer. And then all of a sudden we have a conversation uh, with, a, with a group that is building daycare centers. Hey, would you guys want the other half of this building for your offices, for your worship? And by the way, on Sunday, you can use our daycare center for your preschool children work. If we had known what to ask for, if we'd had the courage, we could not have drawn up the answer that God gave us. And when that happens, that drives you back to worship. What a great God we have. What a fabulous way he has provided for us. Let us tell you about the great things our God is doing in our lives. And from that, we anticipate what he will do. That's when worship is at its best. It's when you come to this moment celebrating what God has been doing in your life. And from that, anticipating what God will yet do. But most of us come with God having done nothing. And you haven't learned anything, you haven't been part of anything, and you look for Dennis or the worship leaders or me to somehow emotionally jack you up, and you want to call that as worship. That's not worship. Uh, that, that's emotional manipulation. Okay? That doesn't change anybody. That doesn't get your life changed. We started talking about this thing at Kairos a couple of years ago. And a friend of mine at Kairos came to me and built a stool for Kairos. And this three-legged stool kind of symbolizes their life. So let me tell you how we do this at Kairos. The well-balanced life has, ha has to have all three of these legs. Now here's most of us. We're good as far as we got. But we kind of sit through life like second base. If somebody runs to us, that's fine. But we're not going anywhere, not going to do anything. Not until worship comes part of our life. Our, our relationship with Jesus Christ always begins with him coming to us with a moment of encounter. All of our stories will begin with, I was here when Jesus came to me. I was into this when Jesus found me. I always get tickled when people say, hey, I found Jesus. No, you didn't. Jesus wasn't lost. It's not the sheep that finds the shepherd. In this encounter, it drives you to discipleship. Because you see, worship in and of itself, it doesn't hold your life, does it? Because we've all left here within great worship. We've all spent time uh, in, in incredible adoration. But the world doesn't get changed in that. Worship drives you to discipleship. I have to know more about this God who I have encountered. I have to know more about who I am. And a lot of us spend a lot of our time there. But your life still won't bear any weight. Not till you add that thing of service and it starts driving you back to discipleship and driving you back to worship do you find out that it takes all three? Sometimes you begin with worship, that drives you to service because you've got to go find somebody and tell them what God's doing. Sometimes you start with discipleship, that drives you back to worship. Sometimes you start with service, that drives you to discipleship. Sometimes you start with worship, that drives you to discipleship. It all drives to each other. There ought to be three things that, that define your life in this coming year. Worship. Loving God with everything that you have. Discipleship. Knowing more and more. Conforming more to Christ. Being transformed more and more to be like him. And then showing that love in some way of service and obedience. That's the way it starts. All three of those 
and few of us have all three of those together. And that's why our lives lean one way or the other. So, as we come to this moment of, of decision and response, it may be a time for you to kind of look at that graph real quick and say, okay, here's, here's the place I need to, to engage. And it may be worship, and that may be creating space in your day so you can focus on worship. It may be discipleship, maybe going out uh, to the discipleship kiosk out there and talking with somebody about how you can get engaged or going over to missions and finding out how you can be of service, how you can find somebody uh, to, to, to love that way. But it takes all three. All three for the well-balanced life. Now, I haven't told you anything today that you do not know. You're not going to walk out of here and go, hey, that was a brilliant insight from Mike. I have told you some things today that you do not do. So to know and not do is the same thing as not to know. 